Good morning, YouTubers. Today I'm going to look at one of the more well-known accessories for the NES, the zapper or light gun as it is also commonly called. While it's an easily recognizable piece of hardware, there weren't really that many games for it. And while it certainly wasn't the first gun-like device to be associated with home video game consoles, it was one of the more common ones. One of the reasons for this was because it was included with many NES consoles. But before I gear up to finish off that dog from Duck Hunt, let's discuss how this thing even worked. First thing I need to mention is it's difficult to know if these things still even work today because they actually require what you'd think of as an old school tube TV set, also known as a CRT TV. Your contemporary high definition set isn't built for this type of device. My advice to you is either go to your local Goodwill, check out Craigslist or eBay, or find an old person who might still have one, although chances are that kind of old person has shot an actual gun at for some reason or another. The reason it won't work on newer TVs is because of the display lag associated with LCDs, plasmas, or any flat screen monitors. CRT monitors, or cathode ray 2 monitors, are really the only ones the zapper will work effectively on. That's because the scan rate of CRT monitors is slower than that of modern HD television sets. Here's how the zapper, or really any light gun, works. During the gameplay, you point the light gun at what you want to shoot. Let's say that duck. After you pull the trigger, the screen briefly goes black for one frame, and in the next frame, the shootable targets are replaced with white squares. If you aim correctly, a device in the light gun detects if you hit the white square and sends a message back to the game. What the device is actually doing is reading the white square as light, and that's what it picks up in its sensor. And if you're not familiar with what I'm referring to when I say frames, television signals are recorded and transmitted in frames. There's really only three different broadcast signals, NTSC, PAL, and CCAM. CCAM is the least common and is only used in places like Syria, the Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. The PAL system is considered more common than CCAM and is used in places like Great Britain, Russia, and what was at the time the Soviet Union, Greece, and India. Many of these places have ceased using either CCAM or PAL and have upgraded to a better quality digital system. The only difference between CCAM and PAL is that CCAM transmits color sequentially. If that's the only real difference, why was CCAM even developed in the first place? Well, you can thank those damn dirty communist bastards in the Soviet Union for that. Now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. Well, now, what happened is um, one of our base commanders, he had a sort of, well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, just a little funny. And uh, he went and did a silly thing. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. Uh, well, let me finish, Dimitri. Something to note was all these systems were analog broadcast signals. An NTSC was also analog and was what North America used as its broadcast signal at the time. That is why the Famicom, which is the Japanese version of the NES, would not work on CRT television sold in North America. From my understanding, it's quite easy to get a Famicom to work on your HGTV. I'm not going to get into a lot of details about the technical differences between each broadcast signal, but what you need to know is PAL is broadcasted at 25 frames per second, while NTSC is broadcasted at 30 frames per second, or more precisely, 29.97 frames per second. But I'm not going beyond that in detail. For more, I suggest you use Google or ask someone over the age of 40 who works in television broadcasting. Now that you hopefully have a better understanding of television broadcast signals, going back to the light gun. When you shoot the trigger, the screen goes black for one frame, followed by a frame with the targets replaced by white squares. If you aim correctly, a device in the light gun tells the game that you hit the target, and the target dies. Unfortunately for those with bad aim, no, that annoying dog does not have a white square associated with him. Early models of the zapper were rumored to be able to trick the light gun into thinking you hit the target just by pointing it at any kind of light. Although many developers at Nintendo claimed that was never the case, even with the early models. But if yours does happen to work by pointing it at a lamp? Before you consider competing that way, just remember that won't help you going up against Dirty Harry. Uh -uh. I know what you're thinking, punk. 
You're thinking, did he fire six shots or only five? Now, to tell you the truth, I forgot myself and all this excitement. But being this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and will blow your head clean off, you've got to ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> now, the Famicom Lycan looks like something you'd need against Dirty Harry. Wow, they really don't make them like they used to. The only other console that comes close to something like that was the Magnavox Odyssey. The only difference in the Famicom Beam Gun, as it was commonly referred, and the Zapper is the plastic casing surrounding the hardware inside has the same parts, same technology, same patent. And before you people point out the other difference in the two, which are the connection ports, that doesn't count in my book. Both the Famicom and North American NES are made up of essentially the same parts and hardware inside as well. The games aren't compatible with their international counterparts because of the NTSC and PAL television signals. But other than that, they are essentially the same technology. While the Zapper was successful in its North American market, thanks in part to being included with many consoles, its Japanese cousin was not very successful in his native market. Compared to the 16 licensed games for the Zapper, there were only 6 total games that supported the Famicom gun, and I'm not including any unlicensed games for either system. But exactly how do these things actually work? Well, the developers of the Leica knew the one thing that would allow it to work for most people at the time was the predictability and consistency of CRTs, or cathode ray tube televisions. The one thing all CRTs of every brand have in common are the guts inside that allow it to work. Nintendo understood that the best way to make this product work for everyone was to utilize the CRT's technology. Or more precisely, to utilize the phosphors hidden behind the glass screen itself. And what is the simplest explanation I can come up with, regardless of the frame rate or whether you're broadcasting in NTSC or PAL, the signal still sends and receives in lines of resolution. You ever heard of 1080i or 720p? That's a reference to lines of resolution. The basic television signal feeds into your television like this. It does this for every frame, so times the number of resolution lines to however many frames per second your television picks up, 25 or 30, and that's how a CRT signal works. One consistency all CRT televisions have in common is the delay of the signal transferring from a connected device, like a VCR or game console, to the TV itself. The software used by the light gun to determine whether the target was hit makes that decision with an algorithm and takes into account the line-by-line -line refresh to remain accurate to within 500 milliseconds. It is this line-by-line -line refresh that makes your zapper useless on your 72-inch high-def TV. The signal your television displays to you is either interlaced, comprised of two separate fields like this, or progressive, illustrated like this. Interlaced video signals are comprised of these two fields to create one single frame. The purpose for this is to save bandwidth during the actual broadcast. Progressive video is comprised of a single frame broadcasted at once, so really only one field compared to the two fields used in interlaced video. While both types of video signals use a line-by-line -line refresh, the speed at which HDTVs refresh, even for an interlaced signal, is too fast for the light sensor in the zapper. And regardless of your region, console, or light gun, that technology was marketable to a mass audience because of the CRT's consistency. While the zapper is well known, it wasn't the only light gun on the market. Sega's master system had the light phaser. It worked exactly like Nintendo's, detecting a white square on a single black frame after shooting the trigger. There were only 13 games released for Sega's light gun. Atari released the XG1 for the XE game system, which was also backwards compatible with both the 7800 and 2600 consoles. Atari even released 5 games on the 7800 that were compatible with it, but there were only 7 games designed for the light gun on the XE game system. In 1992, Nintendo released the successor to their Zapper, dubbed the Super Scope, for the Super Nintendo, which looks something like a bazooka. Because of the technical specification, the Super Scope is classified as a light gun. Some of the differences between it and the Zapper include the transmitter, which is an additional piece of hardware that connects to the console by plugging it into a controller port and placing it on top of the television. And the hit detection works a little differently than previous light guns. Instead of sensing light on a single frame, like the Zapper, 
the Super Scope continuously outputs the signal from the screen's pixels that the transmitter reads and sends to the PPU, or picture processing unit, in the console. The console reads the signal sent by the transmitter as either a 0 or a 1. The 1 transmitted tells the console that's where the Super Scope is pointed, while the 0 indicates where it's not pointed. With this information, the game's software will respond to where the Super Scope is pointed. One of the major downsides was the fact it used AA batteries. While having it cordless is great, having to replace the batteries as often as you did wasn't. There were also only 12 games compatible with the Super Scope. The Super Scope did go on to make several appearances in future Nintendo Wii games, as well as in the 1993 live-action Super Mario Bros. movie. Plus, it made an appearance in a 1993 congressional hearing on violence in video games? Senator, we rely on the Independent Rating Council to help us make those decisions because we at corporate are not psychologists, we're not sociologists, we do not understand the detail of that research that was discussed at the first panel. We rely on experts to help, the, help make those decisions. And they have rated that product MA17, only appropriate for adults. I may also point out that Sega produces product for a rapid fire machine gun that uses the same technology to our understanding with several games available and they have no rating on that product to suggest that product's for I mean, adults. Nintendo produces that you're saying? Yes. Yeah. So it's a similar device, it's a bazooka rather than a handgun. And what is the game that that's, is that for a video game? Mr. Lincoln, do you uh, want to? This is a thing uh, that comes with the, uh, or can be purchased with the Super NES. It obviously uh, doesn't quite look like what you're, you've got in your hands. It's called the Super Scope. The gun that you have in your hand is called the Justifier. I think that uh, this game is a target shoot, this device is for target shooting and whatnot. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'd rest my case with the fact that we're not putting the name Justifier yeah. on it. The light gun developed by Sega for their Genesis console was the Menacer. Look at that thing. Pretty badass. Like the Super Scope, it also took batteries. The Menacer holds together with three detachable parts and uses an infrared sensor to communicate with the television. The Menacer actually came with a six-game bundle, plus other games available that included Terminator 2, the arcade game. Take that, Nintendo. In case you weren't aware, Terminator 2 was the biggest action film of the early 90s. Fellas, if your wife or girlfriend refuses to watch this awesome movie, just remind her James Cameron made it, and that he oh. did a pretty decent job with Titanic. Despite having the appeal of Terminator 2, in the end, the Minister was both a critical and commercial flop. Counting the six-game bundle as six separate games, there were only 13 games ultimately released for the Minister before the game line was discontinued in 1995. Many contribute any light gun's failure to his lack of good supported games, and the Minister sadly qualified as that. Newer light guns or controllers, like the Wii Remote, use infrared to detect the signal used in the game, instead of the original sensor patented. Arcades are known to use what are called positional guns. These work a lot like analog controllers because they're attached to the arcade itself. Because it's limited in movement, the game knows the position you're pointing at. Other arcades use a light gun with similar technology as the Zapper. Konami developed their own light gun for the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Sony PlayStation. The Konami Justifier was used in arcades such as Lethal Enforcers. There's a number of other light guns developed for other consoles, but I'm going to stop there. That is it for this episode of The Bearded Nerd. Thanks for watching. Click the subscribe button if you want to keep up with future videos, and feel free to write hateful comments below. See you next time.